So hi everyone, my name is Liam Johnson. I'm a, a master student at the um, or in the uh, Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Purdue. And as part of my ongoing thesis work, my project was to develop a machine learning model of perturbSeq data for use in spaceflight expression profile analysis. I am amazed I spat that out in one mouthful. Oops, clicking. There we go. Okay. So the goal essentially is to train. Um, a model on these gene expression perturbational data sets in order to predict perturbations in new data sets. A model like this would be useful in identifying specific um, genetic origins of disturbance or perturbations in systems which exhibit largely altered expression profiles from blanket effects like spaceflight, which might come from the environment and provide a transcriptional response, but not necessarily the sources of perturbations. Um, just at a, at a glance. And so some key terms to keep in mind when I'm going through this, because it can be a little tricky, uh, is that when I speak about a perturbation, I'm talking about a um, specific disturbance of a gene or genes due to external interference, whereas the transcriptional response is a shift in the overall profile of genes which are affected by that upstream perturbation. Um, a little bit about these data sets. They first started showing up in 2016, and they're large CRISPR-Cas driven knockout models, followed by screening experiments to provide RNA-seq data, primarily in human and cell or in mouse cell lines. Um, the basic process is to uh, target and systematically knock out individual genes in these homogeneous cell lines, and then to attach an associated sgRNA um, guide barcode. Uh, and annotate each cell with one so that you have a note for each cell about which gene was knocked out, and then you have the overall data from the um, transcriptional response. The specific data set that I worked with is a much newer one. It's from 2022, uh, and it's called the Genome uh, Scale Perturb Seek data set. There are three smaller data sets within it, but essentially they focus um, trying to cover essential cell function and cell cycle regulation. Uh, that study had some original findings on its own just from generating the data set where they were able to identify some of the drivers and con consequences of aneuploidy, but also they found some unanticipated uh, stress regulation responses in the mitochondrial genome. After um, kind of just assessing the data, I went with uh, one of the three sub data sets and began to uh, filter it for the purposes of this project. And after doing that, I was left with a data set with just shy of 300,000 cells that tracks 8,500 sequenced um, genes in its expression profile. And within that, only uh, 2,058 genes were systematically knocked out. So it seems a little smaller than genome wide, but the idea was to cover everything that they could track in these K562 chronic myeloid leukemia cells, which excludes things which would either kill the cell outright or uh, regulate uh, phenotypic behavior, you wouldn't see the cell normally express, and so you wouldn't see a change. And so I clustered it using a Leiden algorithm, which if you're familiar with doing PCA and biological um, data sets like this with Leiden, typically what you'd be looking at here in the clustering is um, a sort of display of different cell types. But this is different because in this case, these are all from a, homo a homologous cell line. What you're seeing in the clusters are drastically different, but maybe similar to each other within the cluster phenotypic responses in the transcriptional profile. And the reason I did this was to develop my data training pipeline, because it's much easier to train a categorical machine learning algorithm on 34 categories than it would be all 2,058 knocked out genes. And so essentially, once I generated these Leiden clusters as categories, I could go back and annotate the AND data object and assign each, cell, assign each cell to its cluster as part of that object and then feed that object to a machine learning algorithm. And if you're not familiar, an AND data object is just a special um, concatenated uh, amalgamation of uh, pandas data frames that's really good for storing things like uh, single cell RNA-seq data. And so the intended result of this would be that a trained algorithm could take any, uh, any new single cells transcriptional expression profile and predict it as belonging to one of those label categories. Uh, the working premise here is that there is a biological significance in each one of these categories, which will have to be determined manually by assessing which genes are most frequent in it. But if you operate on that premise, then that allows you to move forward um, and categorize things. Uh, from there, I went and selected an algorithm 
I use the scikit-learn uh, multiplayer perceptron for a number of reasons, primarily just because it's very straightforward to use. It has a large number of um, adjustable hyperparameters and parameters, and the actual configuration of your layers is very easy to adjust and experiment with in order to optimize. Not to mention the perceptron is the original machine learning algorithm and the first neural net, although it was originally a physical machine rather than a, a piece of software. From there, I did some pretty extensive uh, hyperparameter optimization trials. Initially, I would just start with each one um, before moving on to work on them in combination. And pretty much pushing this to the limits, um, I was able to get about 84.4% accuracy out of this repeatedly, which is acceptable considering a, a null model would be only 3% with this number of categories. So that was uh, promising. And from there, that's allowed me now to move into the future prediction pipeline, which this is still ongoing. But the idea is then to take uh, a, an example data set like the um, OSD 91 from the OSDR repository, which is a study of human um, lympho yeah, lymphoblastoid cells, which have been uh, subjected to microgravity and basically give this to this trained classifier and see if it can slot it into one of these categories. And if it can, then that has implications about which genes are being directly perturbed by the environment underneath the overall transcriptional profile. And then you can go, um, those are then targets for further experimentation and investigation. And so remember, because in the spaceflight data, that's kind of what we're looking for, right? Is the idea that spaceflight isn't individually affecting every single one of those genes which have been shifted in the transcriptional profile. It might only be uh, affecting a much smaller subset of them and everything else we're seeing is just the downstream response. And this would help us identify those genes uh, potentially being affected by matching it back to one of these categories. So, that is, of course, the, the ongoing um, immediate step. But some of the other things I'd like to investigate to uh, sort of bolster this are um, actually outlining the biological significance of each of these cluster partitions. Uh, I've already started work with that, but the results are still preliminary, other than the fact that it looks like there is an underlying pattern to each of them, at least in the broad, like some of them seem to have more to do with certain areas of the actual cell cycle than others. And there, there are different things which can be pulled out of there by running uh, statistical analyses on the frequency of different knockouts, which occur in the cluster as opposed to every other cluster, or the frequency and severity of the perturbed signals as opposed to the other clusters. So that's kind of an ongoing front. In terms of improving the process, I would like to look at um, series training. So there are two other data sets within the one that I use, which are pretty much plug and play compatible because they're part of that larger genome wide one. But there are plenty of other perturbseq data sets out there as well. And if I could kind of train them in series or, or repeatedly train the same algorithm on them, I could get more of a robust model would be the idea. Um, Another thing to look at would be kind of just backing up and using a bit more of a complicated or at least um, complex algorithm than just the basic perceptron, because that's about as simple as you can get um, for machine learning. But it's nice because it's so easy to see what's going on under the hood with it. Um, I would like something capable of multi-class prediction so that I could, rather than try to slot new data into one of those, it could come back and say, this looks like a combination of category 32 and 7, right? Uh, basically. It'd be like an image, uh, an image um, classifier being able to identify two things present in an image instead of just one. Uh, another approach would be to generate heat maps, like you saw with that Leiden map, where you just make a visual heat map for the expression of each gene in your data, and then you feed that to a convolutional neural net in order to one set up to work with images and try to do it in a more visual approach as far as conservation and spatial representation. And a final area that would be really interesting is this data set I use is considered single MOI or multiplicity of infection, meaning that every cell which was hit only received one gene or only one gene was knocked out of every cell that was hit. So, but there are data sets that have higher M multiplicity of infection where there might be two or three genes knocked out of a given cell. And that provides a really interesting opportunity because now you could look at a gene which has a gene, so a cell that had gene A and only gene A knocked out in its profile, and then B, gene B and only gene B knocked out. And then you could go find a cell that had both genes A and B knocked out. And if the sort of summation overlap of the profiles of cells A and B are different, from the profile of cell that had A, B, A and B knocked out, 
then you're likely getting a higher order interaction of some kind with the genes involved. And that might be something that could be potentially a novel finding or something worth investigating as well that you could sort of try to fish out with this. Um, but yeah, uh, the main thing, I guess, is just if if we can reach the end and it's it works a little bit, I'd like to encourage people to use this method with data sets that are important, like these space flight data sets, to go and then generate a perturb seek data set for that associated one with the same cell type, for instance, the lymphoblastoids for the spaceflight data set, and get a much more accurate picture. But the goal here is just to see if the method can be proven feasible. So um, yeah, I, I had a lot of help from a lot of people, and this has been a great opportunity. And so if anybody had any questions, I'm more than glad. Awesome. Great job, Liam. Um, this is certainly outside of my field, but you mentioned aneuploidy, um, mm -hmm. which is having more or less chromosomes than, than natural. So right. uh, like trisomy 21, Down syndrome, and other things like that. But I, I always wonder when I, when I, when I kind of hear of, of talks like this, kind of um, long-term how the research applies to human models. Um, so I'm guessing, you know, if we're looking at perturbations, you know, you're looking at human cells, cell lines, mm -hmm. and then looking at how that might change through time. But how do we then apply that down the road to a full human model? Um, so, for instance, do you think we could we could make predictions for aneuploidy, say for you know in a few decades, maybe from now, maybe 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 further out, but eventually there will be humans born in space. We we will have fetuses develop and humans being born in space. Do you think this model could accurately predict the impacts of space flight um, for so, when we get to that point, or do you think this is kind of a little too early for that? So I'm really glad you asked that question because that's it's it's funny. I actually these data sets exist and they're publicly available because their point of existing was to publish and prove it as a technique and say these can be used. But actually, the fact that they're in cancer cell lines is kind of frustrating for my purposes. And so I would far rather have one done in something else like you know any of the different tissue types for instance if you wanted to specifically look at the osdr it would be very nice to match the cell line type right um so that's my goal is to encourage people to generate better data sets with this project but that is the intent overall that's the motivation behind it is that especially if it was an identical cell then you could use this to sort of get an underlying rule or, or, or I don't want to call it a network because you're literally working with the networks, but a network of rules which govern the effects of space flight so that you can look at these responses and then use this trained algorithm to say, actually, these are the genes being affected. These are the like effects downstream. Go research these genes in particular medically for other areas. See what we need to do. You know, yeah, so that when you went to, if you wanted to have somebody born in space flight and you've got all these effects, well, then you know that really turns out space flight's actually affecting this shorter laundry list of genes. And you can like look at the medical implications of conditions with those. Everything else is just kind of the response overall to compensate for that. Yeah.